I've been working on something fun for the past three months that I wanted to share with you. For the longest time, I've been thinking how to approach this problem from an architectural point of view, and I finally came up with a solution. Maybe it's not the best solution, but it's certainly one of the solutions of all time. I have this app that I've been working on forever. It's a simple utility app for the Mac, but it has about 50,000 monthly active users. And I really, really needed a dashboard to manage said users and also what features they have, the licenses they purchased and so on. And believe it or not, I've been raw dogging the Firebase dashboard to edit this JSON by hand, like a caveman, but it's coming to a point where it's unreasonable to keep doing that. Apart from that, I've been working on another more secret project. It's a book about software engineering, a hundred pages of explanations and illustrations of the most important concepts that I learned at university and at work. There is an early access link in the description, but what does a book have in common with a macOS utility app? One is virtually a static page, almost, and the other is a native Swift app. Turns out they share the backend architecture, specifically authentication, user management, payment processing, and so on. And this is a solved problem, of course, but I came up with an approach that none of the companies that I used to work at used, and I don't see any other people on the internet doing it either. Is there a good reason for that? Probably, but it's up to you to decide and let me know in the comments. So let me show you what I got. I'm gonna do a little demo, walk you through the features, and talk about why I chose to do it this particular way. So sit back and relax. Picture yourself in a meeting room, watching your colleague present a solution and you're sipping that coffee and getting ready to roast them. This part of the video is sponsored by Miro, so let's get started. TLDR, I basically made a proxy. That's it, but it's a proxy with benefits. Miro now have this prompt to diagram feature, and so I'm gonna use that to put something on the page that we can discuss. And I'm just gonna change this box to look like a database. And now in parallel, I wanna show you what this looks like in real life. It's actually deployed and it's a real service you can visit right now. I'm hosting this on Railway and this is the project for the book. So here's the proxy and it's called Startup Box. And then there are two upstream services, the home page, which is a static page, and the book itself, which is almost a static page. Quick note, if you're unsure what a proxy is, at this point, check out the book. Again, link in the description, there's an entire page dedicated to explaining what proxies are and how they are used. But if you already know what a proxy is, you may be wondering, well, why does a proxy need a database? And typically they don't. So that's my innovation. All the user authentication, feature management, and payment logic is implemented in the proxy as a self-contained service, almost like a startup in a box. Let me draw something real quick to show you. Intuitively, it looks something like this. The client is here, request comes in, and the proxy goes, is that a Google authentication redirect? Yes. Then handle it. Is this a payment webhook? Yes. Then handle it right there. And if it isn't any of those, well then let your upstream service handle that. Now, enough theory. Let's do a live demo. When I log in here to my admin dashboard on the proxy itself, you can see a page about authentication. I have Google authentication enabled because I set up my client ID and secret in environment variables. And Microsoft, Discord, and GitHub also are supported in the same way. The proxy exposes endpoints that handle the entire OICD or OAuth2 flows with those providers, with all the redirects and everything. And all of that complexity is hidden from my other services. When the flow is completed, some basic user information is saved in the database right here. In a similar way, you can configure payments with Lemon Squeeze or Stripe, and the proxy will handle all the webhooks, verify all the request signatures, talk to the API, manage all of that state, and ultimately assign or remove access to certain features based on what the user paid for. But back to the diagram. You may be wondering, if this information is stored here in the database, how does any of the upstream services access any of that? They don't really talk to the database, there are no lines connecting these services. Well, that's the benefit of being a proxy. Let's do a sequence diagram and I'll show you how it works. When a request comes in from the client, if the user is logged in, on every request the proxy will look up all of the user information and before sending the request over to your upstream service, it will enrich the request with extra headers containing this information. Let me show you here on localhost. I have this test service that only prints out the headers that it receives, so when I send a request through the proxy, with my authorization token, look what the upstream service actually received. Headers containing the user ID, but also what features the user has. And you may be wondering, where did you get the authorization token? 
Let's open up the developer tools. This is the book page, but it doesn't matter, it's the same. Here you can see that I have a user token and local storage. I have this because during the redirection flows with Google, the proxy saved it for me in local storage. And in the proxy admin dashboard, I can even set the name of that key. Anyhow, in the code base for the book itself, if I navigate to another page of the book, I'm fetching the page content and passing in the token. From there, the proxy will load all the features that I have as a user and will forward them to the book service. And here you can see I got the response because I do in fact have this feature as a user, but on the user management page, I can also decide to block a user. And from then on, the proxy will pretend this user has no features. And now if I refresh the page, the book is giving me the pricing page, because for all it knows, the user has never bought the book. And the real beauty of this is that the book itself is a completely stateless service. It doesn't even have a database. And yet it can do all of this on the fly. So now you may be thinking, okay, that's pretty good. But my question to you is, why stop there? The proxy can modify the request, sure, but it can also modify the response. And here is a super fast rundown of all the extra features that this enables. Number one, you can dynamically add open graph tags. For example, if I return a page with a title and description, the proxy will automatically use those for the OG meta tags. You can inject custom code into any HTML response. You can add custom styles or insert analytics snippets globally. You can also use this for feature flags. For example, you can set some global variables in JavaScript or add something to local storage, or you can even set custom headers to forward that information directly to your backend. But apart from this, which is pretty basic, you can also give some users extra features without them having to buy anything. This is useful for testing or sharing your app with friends. You can impersonate a user, for example, but that has legal implications. And speaking of legal implications, you can choose not to save users' names, for example, because that has GDPR implications. You can also choose to hash their emails in the database so you don't really have them on file, but you can easily search by email in the dashboard and the proxy will handle all of that for you transparently. And finally, there's a terms of service and a privacy policy generator because I found myself writing and copy paste this all the time when I need to apply for a Google client ID and secret, but now I made this feature where I only enter my company name and it generates some very basic version of those documents that I can use as an MVP. Alright, I hope you see why it took me like three months to make this and why it's called Startup in a Box. So check out Miro for free and try their Create the AI feature. All the links are in the description below and thanks Miro for sponsoring this video.